I think there's a, a lot to unpack here for what seems to be a, a oh. big deal. And uh, I know it's quite complicated. I think a lot of people see settlement. They see $2.7 billion. They see revenue sharing. To the best of your ability, can you kind of uh, unpack what just happened? <laughs> I mean, basically, the NCAA, they're like, oh, and forever in lawsuits, right? And, uh, uh, you know, as soon as you see, you see that happens, you've got blood in the water and the sharks start circling. And uh, a lot of athletes' rights groups and, and attorneys, uh, civil uh, litigation attorneys, see an opportunity and they just start suing the NCAA and, they're, and they don't want to lose any more lawsuits. So they settled this. And, and if they had lost this lawsuit, um, it's an antitrust lawsuit. There's a, a tripling factor in damages that they could have faced. And so basically, um, this was cutting their losses. This was not a step forward for college athletics. This is just an admission that they lost and they lost big and now they're going to pay for it. And and people see the $2.7 billion that the NCAA is going to pay. Some of it is back pay. Some of it is pay to current players. How exactly, to your understanding, is that going to work? So what's going to happen is, yeah, th there's going to be some back damages. A lot of that is going to come out of um, – NCAA reserves, and then also every June, the NCAA makes um, distribution payments to every school in the country. And those come from a number of sources, primarily from the men's basketball tournament. Uh, and we all know about the, the NCAA units. So when San Diego State wins you know, X number of games in the tournament, you get X number of units associated with those wins, and they go to the Mountain West, and they get distributed within the Mountain West. So there's those, but there's also other uh, categories, a whole bunch of other ones. And schools rely on these distributions to balance their athletic budgets. A lot of this, uh, these back damages are going to come out of that. So those payments coming to schools are going to be less. Uh, and the big fight is the power conferences are going to pay more per school, but the other conferences like a San Diego State, a group of five conferences, mid-majors, whatever you want to call them, are going to pay a higher percentage uh, compared to their regular revenues. And so it could actually hit them worse. And that was a big argument that the, that the smaller schools lost. And then in addition to that, there are um, uh, annual revenue, uh, percentages of revenues, payments that are gonna be distributed to athletes going forward for the next 10 years. And that's to avoid litigation for the next 10 years. So basically they just, please don't sue us. We'll pay you a bunch of money. And that's what they'll be doing. And it's, I think it's believed 22% of your quote unquote revenue um, for those power conferences. And it's going to be about $20 million a year that will eventually trickle down to the athletes. Now, how that happens is another fight that, you know, we'll see um, playing out over the next few months. And is that $20 million per a school or per a Power 5 conference? Per school. That's quite a bit of money. Um, now, again, is that going to all go to football players? Is it all going to go to football and, and basketball players? Or is... Uh, are the Title IX advocates going to get involved and maybe counter sue those people saying, wait a minute, this, this is, you know, the universities are still uh, subject to Title IX. You've got to pay the female athletes equally. Uh, and then that amount gets diluted uh, among a bunch of athletes, uh, even if you're in a sport that doesn't necessarily uh, have those kind of revenue streams. So that's going to be an interesting fight to see. And they haven't really been, been very vague about how that's going to work out. And one big thing that that seems to have come out of this that maybe it's not brushed under the rug, but it feels like everyone wants to talk about the settlement. But what came out of it was schools can now directly pay these players, correct? Yes. In the po Power Five, at least, right? It's only Power Five, and they can directly pay these players now. Yeah, I mean, I I would think any conference that wants to you know adopt these rules uh, can, uh, but I don't see how a smaller school or smaller conference is going to be able to afford this. I mean, it's just enormous amounts of money. I mean, $500,000 to a mid-major school is an enormous amount of money. Now you're talking 20 million a year. Um, but yes, uh, these will be direct payments coming from the school. And this is, I guess, one of the big changes. I mean, NIL payments were technically coming from boosters supporting the school, but those lines are starting to blur already. And so this just, you know, makes it sort of official. The schools are paying the athletes now. So in a theoretical here, a, a school could say, hey, we have this $20 million pool that we're sharing, revenue sharing. We want to give X quarterback a million dollars, plus he can also make NIL on top of that, right? Well, that's something else to be worked out. They're trying to put some guardrails on what that NIL is. It has to be, quote, unquote, real NIL, which means you're, you're, you're marketing your name, image, and license and, uh, instead of just a chunk of money that players are getting right now. 
Um, but that's going to be interesting to see as well. I mean, I, you know, yes, this is sort of like a quote unquote college salary cap, but in, in some ways, it's going to be a very soft cap if they allow NIL to continue the way that it has. And, and to this point, we don't know yet whether whatever player could be getting part of the revenue share and part of NIL if it was true NIL. So this player makes $3 million from Michigan to play quarterback, but he's also got a deal here and here and here with NIL. That's all possible, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. I just, uh, you know, for me, what I would do, uh, and I just don't understand why universities haven't done this. Um, look, for decades, they've been developing athletes for the NBA and the, uh, and the NFL for free. And in Europe, that doesn't happen. You know, in Europe, there is no college sports like we know it, but there are lots of clubs. So when you're 16 or 18, you sign with a club, a professional club. You have a professional contract. They control your rights. And if a bigger club wants you, if Barcelona wants you, uh, if Manchester United wants you, they pay a transfer fee to basically buy your contract and buy your rights. Um, and there aren't really trades. It's just transfer fees. And those transfer fees can be over $100 million in, in the highest level. But in the lower levels, they're 500000 200000 maybe a million. And that's how the smaller clubs make money. And what I just don't understand is the NCAA is just going to give away money it really doesn't have um, with nothing in return. And, and, and for developing athletes for free for these, for these two big leagues. And I, I, don't, I just don't get that. And one thing people need to understand is I think the biggest misconception out there and, and the thing the NCAA has done a horrible job at messaging is that everyone thinks there's this giant money tree in the backyard of every single athletic department across the country. And they're just rolling in the dough and, and, and these poor kids aren't getting any part of it. Um, there's 12, about 1,200 Division one, two, or three schools in the NCAA. About 20 of them actually make money as an athletic department. And when you come down to San Diego State level, San Diego State's budget is overwhelmingly subsidized through public means. And that's uh, the general fund of the university, which is your and my tax dollars. That's strictly state tax dollars. Uh, there's huge student fees uh, once you get out of the power conferences. Um, and then there's donations. And that's what's upholding athletic departments. Without those three things, uh, they would go broke overnight. And it wouldn't even be close. It'd be like running a company and, and having revenues that were you know 25 to 30% of your expenses. You just go broke. And so people think there's all this money that the athletes aren't getting. There really isn't. And so one of my big concerns about this settlement is, OK, you're a power conference that has maybe been balancing your budget because you get a lot of money from TV revenues through your conference. Now, all of a sudden, you've got to get this $20 million chunk, and you're going to have fewer revenues coming in because of the settlement. And you've got to pay that out. And you don't have the funds to do that. Where you are going to get the money? You're going to do what, what the mid-major schools do. You're going to go to get uh, money from the general fund, which is taxpayer dollars, and you're going to start charging student fees to make up that difference. And, and so the poor consumer is going to get hit with this. And the, the players are going to be happy, but there just isn't the same amount of money or the amount of money that people think there is floating out, floating around out there. There just isn't. And, and is it fair to say, and, and it's fine to tell me I'm wrong here, but did the NCAA, because I think back to what you said earlier about the, the sharks circling the blood in the water, is it fair to say the NCAA just did all this to stay relevant? They messed up a little oh, back when the NIL thing came 100%. about. But now they're just going, hey, this is all we got left? 100%. This was an existential decision. I mean, they were going out of business if they lost this lawsuit, or they were afraid they're going to go out of business. And this is just so the athletic directors and conferences and keep playing and keep getting that TV money and being relevant and, and winning championships and being popular and, and filling stadiums. That's what this is about. Um, but it, it's just a matter of time before, you know, the problem is that that college athletics is a big, big business. No one has really wanted to admit that. And it should be a pro for profit industry that you pay athletes and you're, and you're making profits, but you also have to uh, answer to market forces. Uh, and if you're not bringing enough revenue, you can't keep paying athletes exorbitant amounts or you go you go BK. And uh, because they're part of it, and the reason why athletic departments have remained part of uh, the university and not broken off into for-profit enterprises is because they get the tax break. They don't have to pay taxes. And so that's a big, big thing to, to, to sacrifice. But if you sacrifice that, you don't have Title IX. So it's it's this balancing act right now where right now athletic departments get a tax break, but they've got to pay for all these sports that don't, don't make enough money for them and, and, and are, are in the red. 
versus if they go for profit, they don't have to pay for the rest of those sports because Title IX, IX doesn't apply to for profit enterprises, but they don't get a tax break. Uh, and so that's there's a there's this this undercurrent no one talks about, but this is balancing act. And sooner or later, those numbers will will get to the point where I think they'll feel like we just got to go for profit. We'll sacrifice the tax break. And maybe this is an uneducated statement by me. When I was playing in college, it, the whole thing was the NCAA is here to protect you, protect you, the, the student athlete. What does the NCAA even do now? Well, the problem is the NCAA, you know, people like to point to the NCAA and, and, and say, you know, it's done everything wrong and it's an easy target. But the NCAA is the schools, you know, it, it, it's all these schools put together. That's what the NCAA is. So it's, it's too easy of a target, too, too simple and too obvious. Um, but the problem is, to your point, is that the NCAA represents 1,200 schools and they all have different priorities. I mean, that's all these Division three schools that have a completely different model than Division one schools. And even within Division one, I, I think there's three tiers. There's the, there's the, power, the four power conferences now. There's the, the group of five, which is the Mountain West and the American Athletic Conference, uh, those type of conferences. And then there's the, the low majors uh, that are just sort of wallowing around in Division One and really don't have very much money and very few resources. And, and then you have Division Two, and then you have Division Three. And even within those divisions, there's there's hierarchies. Uh, but what fits Division Three doesn't fit Division One anymore, the top of Division One. They've just gone in two different directions. I mean, before they kind of did, like you said, they were protecting the athlete. But these athletes, at the highest levels of Division One in football, men's basketball, these are no longer students. These are just professional athletes, and we have to accept that. At Division Three, they're still students, and so it's it's almost like you need different organizations to run each of them. And I think that's the direction we're going. That's well said. That makes a lot of sense. And and you really led me right into my next question. At least the Power Five or the top tiers, as you're talking about, is there anything amateur left about it? No. Not in football, men's basketball. I mean, and and I'm waiting for, you know, someone to challenge the idea of you only can play four years. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of an arbitrary rule that they've kind of set up. Why, if they're, if they're making money, wouldn't that be a, you know, aren't you you're taking money out of their pockets? Um, you know, I'm waiting for that to happen. I'm waiting for, do they really even have to go to school? Do they have to have a certain grade point average? I mean, there isn't that connection anymore. And particularly if one day these, the, the football, men's basketball, pull away from an athletic department and just sort of loosely affiliated, wear the uniforms, play in the stadiums. There's really no reason at all for anybody to go to school. And so I think that's one of the things that we're moving in that direction. We're not quite there yet, but I think they're sort of giving lip service to the academic side of it now. Um, whereas at the lower levels, it's still a big part of, of your experience. Doesn't this open it up to your point to unionizing, to health benefits that athletes will ask for, all these things that happen when you are a paid employer? Well, that's the thing is they want to pay them, but they don't want them to be employees. And and I just think it's a matter of time before they win um, one of these NLRB uh, complaints. There's a bunch of them out there. Um, there's one at USC, the Dartmouth men's basketball team did it, Northwestern. There's a bunch of them, sort of little fires that are just kind of starting to smolder out there. And and one of those will flare up and, and someone will have to make a decision. If they declare them employees, then I think that, you know, this will this will sort of move for that for-profit you know model but um yeah that's that's definitely the once you're when you're giving them money it's hard to say they're not employees and i, and I think that's just a an, an inevitable, uh, inevitable uh, conclusion that's kind of the macro level we've talked about a bunch let's talk more micro san diego and and in san diego state especially what this means you know there's been a separation between the power five and the group of five if you will it seems like it's going to become a seismic separation at this point. I mean, what does this mean for the Aztecs for San Diego State? Well, you've already seen it in football. Just watch the NFL, the last NFL draft. How many, how many uh, group of five players, uh, players from group of five schools were drafted? And then how many started a group of five schools, went to a power conference school and got drafted? Uh, and so you can already see it uh, just in the transfers. And in basketball, um, it's not quite as dramatic, but we're starting to see it this summer with, the number of players and the type of players who have transferred out. I mean, the best example is uh, New Mexico, JT Toppin, uh, who was the, the Mountain West freshman of the year, uh, looked like he was going to stay. And from my sources, it told me he was going to make 500000 in NIL. Uh, on the last day or right before the deadline, he jumps out, uh, jumps into the portal and leaves New Mexico. Now, he might turn pro. He's that good. But if he stays in college, I mean, he had $500,000. He could have 
uh, you know, have that secured, he thinks he can make much more. And that's, uh, that's about as much as, as, as that is the absolute maximum that anybody in the Mountain West can, can offer. And that's far and above what anyone in San Diego State would be getting. And you still can't keep the player. Uh, and so I think that's, we're just seeing um, the beginnings of, of in basketball, what we're already seeing in football. And I think it'll just be about two or three years and you'll see this big separation. Now, San Diego State is unique because in basketball, they have this tradition. They have a great arena. They have a veteran coaching staff. They have a winning tradition and so they turn them in pedigree. They're still going to be able to attract players, but can they keep up? And to me, it's going to be fascinating to see if they can. And they're going to try to keep up with chemistry and culture uh, and getting the right, targeting the right player. You don't need as many players in basketball. Maybe you can find those two or three players aren't as interested in money and are willing to come. Um, but it's just going to make it really, really hard. This may be a loaded question, and you might not have an answer to it, but what do you think this does to fan bases when college athletics, especially that top tier, gets to where it's going and it becomes pro athletics? Do you think fans will lose that love that made college sports so much fun for them? You know, the the, the kids playing for the love of the game, all that kind of stuff? Or do you think because it might be a slower burn, that thing, that, that fans won't mind as much? Well, no, I think I think 100% you're going to see that. I don't know how dramatic, how quickly it'll happen. But I mean, just look at um, look at the G League in basketball. Okay, those are really, really good players. Okay, a G League team would just wipe any college team off the floor. But no one watches the G League. I mean, they get 200 fans. I mean, nobody watches it. it it's hard to find on TV. Um, you know, you've got to you find YouTube broadcasts of it and, and that type of thing. I've always said that with college athletics, the name of the front of the jersey is way more important than the name of the back. I know the athletes don't want to hear that, but I think you could take five frat guys from, you know, uh, from Duke and play five frat guys from Kansas. And if that was what all there was in college sports and it was sort of a level playing field, I still think people would go and watch. And I think it's more about the association with the university, the connection with the athletes, that they're like all those things you just said. Uh, and when you remove that, you're really in danger of losing what the popularity of college athletics was. I, I, I think people are misguided if they think people are watching college sports because they're like the future pros. I don't think that's it at all. I think they're watching it because of an association with the university or community uh, that has been around for a hundred years and built a brand. Uh, I think that's what it is. And there, there are some exceptions, you know, Zion Williamson a few years ago, Caitlin Clark this year, certainly there people are coming to watch that particular athlete, but 99.9% .9 of the time they're coming to watch the, the athletes playing for a university. Uh, and if that starts to go away, and, and another thing to your point is when you see this much uh, upheaval and roster churn and guys are leaving every year, it's hard for the fan to follow it. I mean, the hardcore fan, yes, but the casual fan who kind of maybe tunes in in March, wait a minute, I don't, I mean, when they, if, if the casual fan tunes in next March to watch San Diego State play, they're not going to know who anybody is because the entire starting five who started in the Sweet 16 against UConn is gone. You're a guy that, that loves college sports. You know a ton about it. I'm curious. I obviously don't think anyone aside from players in college could say this is a good thing. It, it feels like we're teetering on this edge of falling off the cliff. Now, that could be recency bias. That could be all these things. But this cannot be a good thing any way you slice it, right? Or, or is that a naive statement? I don't think it is. It's a really good thing for the athletes. They're going to make money. And, and uh, they're going to make more money than they will most of them making who are lucky enough to play professionally are going to make. Now, the very elite will make more in the NFL and the NBA. But, you know, those kids who go to Europe and play, they're not going to make more in college now. Uh, and so it's great for them. But I think for everybody else, for the, for the, the budgets of, of these athletic departments, for the fans, uh, you know, for the community in general, I think it's a bad thing. And I think, you know, it's not just this settlement. It's been sort of trending in this direction um, for a number of years. And, and, you know, the NCAA has been unable to stop it. Uh, and you can, you know, you can attack some of their legal strategies. Maybe it was inevitable and it was going to happen anyway, but there's nothing they really can do about it. And I think we're just, like you said, we're just sort of sliding down a slope. And, and how quickly we start sliding remains to be seen, but uh, we're definitely sliding. Last thing I got for you, do you think this was almost 
I'm trying to think of the right way to word it, but the college sports got so popular that I don't know how the NCAA was going to control some of these Tebow's and some of these Johnny Manziel's. And because of that exact popularity kind of became the thing that bit them in the butt, right? That came back and so, Hey, we're making you all this money. Why aren't we the ones getting it? I don't know if, if the NCAA even knew what would hit them when it all kind of came up. Was there a way to regulate this before? Was there an answer that they missed? I think I, you know, I've talked to a couple of athletic directors who are actual attorneys. There aren't very many of them, um, but the ones who I know who are who understand how athletics work, and it's it, it, it's really a unique system again because you're you, there's a lot of regulation with Title IX, um, and then you're trying to operate in a capitalist world, and so it's it, it it's really really wow. tricky. So you talk to those people who understand sports, but also understand law, and what they've told me with a mistake the NCAA made was um, sort of looking at themselves. Um, as their own ecosystem, instead of saying, hey, we're part of a larger ecosystem here. We're just one option for, for um, athletes coming out of high school. You know, they don't have to come play for us. They can go play in the G League. They can go play professionally in Australia. Um, there's overtime elite. And in fact, last year in the NBA draft, I mean, like first five picks came from like five different sort of feeder systems. And what they should have said, according to these people, is, look, this is what we offer. We offer scholarship. We offer all these benefits that we think add up to you know, $200,000, $250,000 a year when you, when you look at the whole picture. Um, and we think that's pretty well compensated uh, compensation. And this is just what we do. And if you don't want to come, no problem. Uh, instead of trying to accommodate all these athletes and act like you are the only option they have. Uh, and that's where they, you know, they maybe should have drawn a line, a legal line in the sand and fought it. And they, and they didn't. And here we are. Mark, this is a super complicated, a lot of moving parts, probably a million questions that I should ask to help clear it up. Is there anything that maybe I missed that you go, oh, this would this is something I really should have wanted to touch on, or or this really helps kind of people understand it all? No, I mean, I just think I I, I think your point about people not understanding it is really well taken because I, I I don't think people know what to think of this. You know, it gets to be law and settlements and and this huge amounts of money and they don't really understand and, and I just go back to my point of there isn't as much money in college athletics as people think and um, you know I think the big losers in this as we get you know five or ten years down the road are going to be the Olympic sports and that's not just women there'll be some men's sports too um, if they if they move into a for-profit model and they just you know they just have football men's basketball teams and the rest of those sports are kind of left to fend for themselves and universities are going to have to pay for them. Uh, you're going to, you're going to see them really cut back or just eliminate it altogether. And if you look at the division three model, I think that's, it's probably the healthiest model. Uh, no scholarships. You're playing for the love of the sport. The workouts aren't as intense in your off season. Um, the travel is not much more than a, a van or a bus, uh, or in some cases walking down the street to a school just nearby. Um, and, and, you know, I think a lot of those sports are probably going to head more towards Division Three than where they are right now. Uh, and, and that's I'm sad to see that. And what, what shocks me is that, like, the Title IX women's sports advocates don't see this coming and, or, or maybe they just aren't accepting it. And I really think, you know, by if they support what's happening in the men's uh, basketball and football with these payments, um, they're just stealing and signing their own death warrant, warrant. And I don't think they, they really have, there's enough urgency from them saying, whoa, hold on here. You know, our model's about to blow up and we're going to get hurt. Um, and athletic department, you know, athletic director's number one job is to balance the budget. And they don't want to, none of them want to cut sports. And you ask them to a, to a man or a woman, they do not want to cut sports. That's the worst thing they could possibly do. But they ha their charge is to, to balance the budget. And the only way they can do that as we go forward, probably is going to be cutting sports or really, really reducing the services for those sports. Yeah, their hands are going to be kind of tied coming forward here. I, yeah. I really appreciate you taking the time to shine some light on it. Again, it's a it's a confusing thing, and and uh, you're really well uh, knowledgeable about it. Also, really appreciate the time, and and thank you. Yeah, very no much. problem. Great questions too. I mean, obviously, you know, understand it. I mean, so many people don't, so I appreciate that. No, I mean, I appreciate you. I, I, I got a general idea of it, but man, it's there's a lot of moving parts. So thank you. Well, I don't think there's all the answers either, right? No, I mean, like right. the Title IX piece, the NIL piece, um, you know, the employee piece. Uh, I, I think this thing could be, you know, fought and, and scrapped about for months, maybe years. 
So we'll see where it goes next. But I, I was, I'm getting ready to write a column just saying, look, just pay the freaking athletes, make them employees, make this a for-profit adventure, and sign the five-year contracts out of high school and, and tell the NBA and NFL, you want them, you pay us. We're not doing this for free anymore because we need another source of revenue if we're paying the athletes this much and we don't have the money, and this is how we're going to do it. It seems to be the only option. I mean, not that I'm a smart dude, but I've thought it through a lot. And I, that seems to be the only way you could really go about it. I, I, I mean, you're yeah. too far down the rabbit hole at this point to, to go any other way. <laughs> and that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to, they're trying to appease and try to keep Title IX intact and try to keep their, their, their tax break as a, as a you know, part of the educational mission. They're trying to keep all that intact. And it's like, just blow up the model at this point. Just, you know, just become sort of satellite, you know, professional clubs that are developing players because that's what happens. You know, that's the way it is in the rest of the world. And why are you giving these, this talent that you developed for free? And it's not just the development of the talent, it's the platform that, you know, if you just had high school players and the NFL had to go try to project which of those high school players are going to be NFL players and sign them, I mean, it'd be a huge amount of money. There'd be tons of misses. And this gives them a platform to all play against each other. And not only are they getting developed, but they can see who really excels and whose athleticism is better than others. I mean, you know, and it just makes their job way easier and way cheaper. And it's like, you know what? You guys got to start paying your share, too.